Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn for this evening is hymn number 484. 484 will sing stanzas 1, 2, and 3. cover of our worship bulletin as we join together in the confession of our sins. Dearly loved by the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father. Ask in Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me and am deeply sorry for them. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. We continue with the singing of the Gloria and Excelsis. Lord, your hands made me and formed me. 
Give me understanding to learn your commands. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, you formed and fashioned us all, and you knew each of us before we were born. Help us to carry out those things you have asked us to do, especially the sharing of your holy word, which is the only way which can save us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. fourth week in the season of Epiphany, we continue to see Jesus as the Messiah, but also that his word, which will never change, needs to be preached into all the world, as he also commanded us right before he left and ascended into heaven. We see in our epistle lesson for this week, God's word will stand forever, and now in our letter to the Corinthians, beginning at the 12th chapter, the 27th verse, the Lord reminds us how the church conducts itself here in the world. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put up childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see him face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Here ends our epistle lesson. Our psalm for the day is taken from the first half of Psalm 65. We begin by singing the refrain. Hear prayer. To you all people will come. 
When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness. O God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who are on mountains by your power, having wrapped yourself with strength. Surely it is God who saves me. continues in Luke chapter 4 this week we pick it up in verse 21 with Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth and he began by saying to them today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips isn't this Joseph's son they asked Jesus said to them surely you will quote, quote this proverb to me physician heal yourself do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any one of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began teaching uh, to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. Here ends our gospel lesson. We're now joined in confession our Christian faith this week according to the explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent sufferings and death, that I should be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Even as he is risen from death, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Well, turn to our sermon hymn for this evening, hymn number 639. 639.
peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who was to come. Amen. The text for our meditation this evening is recorded in the beginning of the prophet Jeremiah, the first chapter beginning at verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. These are the words of our Lord. In the name of our Savior, dear Christian friends, if a child was sent out to the garage to tell Dad to come in for supper, and the child ran out, the child comes back, and they're sitting down at the table, and no Dad. Well, if he doesn't come in, is it going to be the child's fault? Are you going to blame the child? Or was it Dad's fault? Or was he stuck in the middle of something where he couldn't just drop it and run right in the house? So, sometimes we do ask children to go pass a message on. Sometimes they answer the phone. Maybe mom's up to her elbows in flour and the phone rings and how are you going to answer the phone? So the child maybe is told to answer the phone. And if they can't understand or they don't get the name right, well, okay. You know, I don't think too many people would feel comfortable with a 12, 13 year old behind the wheel of a big tractor pulling grain boxes down uh, County F. And yet, I've seen some pretty young kids doing some pretty phenomenal things as farm kids. And it wasn't beneath them or uh, I'm sure the parents knew when they were able and capable. Now it's an interesting thing that we hear the Lord's call to the prophet Jeremiah. And he sounds like he's pretty young at the time. He's pretty young. And yet the word of the Lord came to him and called him to be his prophet. And in the same vein, you and I also have to acknowledge that the word of the Lord has come to us also. And it has called us. And for both Jeremiah, who was called immediately, directly by God, and for us, who were called indirectly by God through the word and the sacraments, both of us have the same task. And when you look at every single position, like all those positions that the apostle mentioned in a letter to the Corinthians, all those positions have the same goal. And this is, God sets us apart, He chooses us, He appoints us, and He wants us to proclaim His Word. And whatever capability and capacity that He places us in while we live here in this earth. Now, for Jeremiah, this was a special call. No differently than the call of Moses, the, or the call of Isaiah. And all of these were, even the calls of the apostles, those were direct special calls, directly from the Lord himself as he took on human flesh and blood. So we hear the Lord appear to Jeremiah, and saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I set you apart. Kind of like John the Baptist, right? Before John the Baptist was even, uh, he was set apart. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So he's set apart, just like Samson was too, as one of the judges. 
set apart from birth, set apart right away. Consecrated, dedicated to serve God. Now, uh, for you and I, uh, we hear Jeremiah's response. Uh, Lord, I don't know how to speak. I am only a child. He might have been right in his description about himself. And he probably wasn't of an age where he felt that he could go do this. <laughs> now, did the Lord accept that? Absolutely not. He said, you must. It is necessary. You have to do this. And you must go and speak to whoever I tell you, and you tell them whatever I command you to tell them. And notice that the Lord also uh, kind of reminds him. He takes away his excuses and his fears and his worries. Um, if a child was told to go talk to a CEO of a corporation, or a, a child was told to pull a person over and give him a ticket, you know, that, that would feel way beyond their pay grade, wouldn't it? And so Jeremiah here, what does the Lord do for him to take away his concerns? The Lord says, I will be with you and I will rescue you. So, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. I'll be with you and I will rescue you. Now, when you read the rest of the prophet Jeremiah, he did have reason to be afraid. The last five kings of Judah who he served and prophesied to, some of these kings only reigned three months, and others reigned for many years. And Jeremiah was the prophet who was the prophet to Judah when it finally was destroyed. And the Lord took him out in exile. So Jeremiah saw the waning days of Judah in his time period, and it was not fun. And he was put under threat of death several times during his ministry. So he did have cause and reason to be afraid. He was the son of a priest. I'm sure he had seen enough go on with his father as a priest of the Lord Most High, uh, trying to reach some people who had so far gone spiritually and away from the Lord. So Jeremiah here, the Lord tells him, I don't want you to be afraid. I will rescue you. And he did exactly that. He did exactly that every single time. Now for us, for us today, we've been called by ordinary means. The means that God put into place when Jesus ascended into heaven, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here you have the command given to the church. What are we to do? We are to preach and teach and baptize and bring people into God's family and church. And sometimes, I'll bet, we possibly don't feel up to the task when maybe the opportunity presents itself. I don't know what to say. Or I might say the wrong thing. Or I'm just a lay person. How would I know what to say? Or they won't listen to me. I'll bet you, for Jeremiah, he could have used that same excuse. They won't listen to me because they didn't. They wouldn't. There were a few that did, but for the most part, they didn't listen to him. But notice that's not what God is asking. He's not saying, if you think they're going to listen to you, then you'd start telling them. Notice he says, you must, you must tell them everything I command you. And for us today, it's the same command. Law and gospel. Thou shalt not. I'm sure we can see that all around us in the lives of some uh, families and people around us. Where we may need to point out sin where God calls it sin. And then at the same time, we've got an awesome message. Here's Jesus, the Savior of the world. Now, when you and I, uh, the word of the Lord has come to us. And he has set us apart. He's called us. He's predestined us for what? Eternal life. 
we know where we're going. He's told us we don't have to be afraid. And he's also told us, I will be with you. Which is what Jesus said to his church right before he ascended. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the world. So the same promises that he made to Jeremiah, he makes to us too. Now I suppose we can ask ourselves, how well have we done? When the opportunities possibly presented themselves to us, and have we always given a clear witness of God's word, which he brought to us? And if we haven't, well, that's why Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh. He was set apart before birth. He was appointed long before he was born. And this one who was set apart, how did his teaching fare among, among a lot of his fellow Israelites? Sometimes not so well. Look at our gospel lesson. The people from Nazareth wanted to throw him off the cliff. And we said in Bible class last week, one of the questions, Jesus was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And it's true. So Jesus taught in his hometown of Nazareth, and he wanted to throw him off the cliff. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him long before he was born. And in Bible class, we saw that. Before he goes up to Jerusalem to die, he tells his disciples time and time again, must, must go up to Jerusalem, must be betrayed in the hands of simple men, must suffer and die, and on the third day be raised to life. Look at all those musts that Jesus had to undergo for us and for our salvation. He always spoke God's word correctly, truthfully, faithfully every time. Even at the expense of what it was going to cost him, being falsely accused and crucified. But there he paid for our sins. And there he gave us eternal life through the faith he has now called us to believe in. So we who have been set apart by God's word to be saved, to have eternal life, we've also been set apart to proclaim his word. Now, for Jeremiah, he was specifically to proclaim, and then as the prophet continued here, the Lord had Jeremiah prophesy about nine nations and kingdoms, and all of it was judgment. And all of the judgments that God proclaimed through Jeremiah all came true. And every single one of these nine kingdoms or nations that he proclaimed against with judgment, it all happened. And they all were devastated. God's word kept true. And it always will. Just like God kept his word true when he sent Jesus. And when he saved us. And so God's word will always be true too, yet for us today to the very end of the world. So for us today, our synod, our church, and each of us as individuals have all been called to proclaim this word. And for us, it's a little easier task than Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called during the waning days of the tribe of Judah. And for us today, uh, we need only preach that word and let the Holy Spirit do its work when and what, how and what time table he wishes. You know, for us today, how many more nations will rise and fall? How many more nations will collapse and change around us? We don't know. Will our own nation keep on a downward moral slide, or will it finally be turned back uh, toward God? These are all questions we don't know. But you and I have been called to proclaim and to support that proclamation however possible. So for us, our ministries, our calls are a little different than Jeremiah's. There's a lot more hope in our uh, proclaiming the word than there was in Jeremiah's. He had a really rough road. A couple of times, boy, he really hit the dumps. He really got low. And the Lord had to call him back to his sentence, senses, call him to repentance, and, and get him back on track. And when you read the whole book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's life was tough. He, had, he, he was one of the few prophets where there wasn't a lot of good stuff. 
And yet in Jeremiah, man, we got some really good gospel promises about the coming Savior and about the coming New Testament church of which we are a part. And many blessings that we enjoy as New Testament Christians. So, in our day and age, in the period in which God has us, We'll never know where and when another believer is going to be sprouted because God's word was planted in their hearts and the Holy Spirit called them to faith through it. And that's our job, right? Preach the word. In fact, the apostles, even under pressure, had finally had to say when they were under arrest, how can we not but speak of the things of which we have heard and seen? And when they were told, don't you dare preach anymore in this name of Jesus, we must obey God rather than men. And so we have the privilege of being called by God to be his own and to continue to share the only good news that saves people from their sins and gives them eternal life. What a privilege. What an honor. Sometimes, yes, it doesn't seem like it, but it is. And we look forward to the day when like Jeremiah, when like Moses, when like Isaiah, we hear from our Savior on that last day, standing in the glorious before his heavenly kingdom and throne, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's a cool thing to hear from our Lord and Savior who died for us and got us there so that we could be with him forever. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now turn to the hymn on the bottom of page 6 in our worship bulletins. <laughs>
like the prophets and all the believers before us, you called us, you chose us, even before we were born, you predestined us for eternal life. We thank you that you went through all the necessary steps to save us from our sins, sending your one and only Son, appointing, setting apart, choosing him to be that Savior of the world and the Savior of us all. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you underwent, both the faithful preaching, the suffering, and even the dying, so that we might be with you forever. We thank you that you turned our hearts from a stony heart of unbelief to a heart of faith, uh, through the power of your word and your Holy Spirit calling us to this uh, excellent faith. Keep us in it as we continue, then, to carry out the work that you have given us to do, and that is to preach your name, however possible, in whatever way, to all those around us as we continue to point them to you as their only Savior from sin and only gate into heaven. Help our synod, our congregations, and all of us to continue to do this faithfully. Give us wisdom to do this in whatever way possible in, in our day and age and in our nation so that many more are able to hear of you and so be saved. We ask this all in your holy name, you who have also then taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.